ISO FileMaker Magazine, the professional's resource for FileMaker know-how. Well, hello there, my fellow FileMaker developers and enthusiasts. This is Matt Petrowski bringing you these FileMaker tutorials over at my website, FileMakerMagazine.com. In this video tutorial, we are taking a look at using curl within FileMaker, and we're going to be getting started with plugins. Now, curl is pretty much the backbone of the internet for most of the way that most applications connect to web services. Let's take a look at the file, see what I'm talking about. All right, now first off, the file that we're working with really isn't that much of a file. It's basically just a new FileMaker file that I created here. You can do the same, just go to new solution and create a file. There's really nothing going on in this file. But what we do need to be aware of within FileMaker is that I have a couple of plugins installed because you're going to need plugins in order to work with curl. Now I should mention FileMaker behind the scenes actually does use curl in order to uh, connect to its web services. The difference is we can't actually control all of the individual settings that make curl so powerful. So over here we have curl, the website for curl, it's at curl.haxx.se. Hacksy, so it's not a hack website. It's not something that you need to be afraid of. It's been here for years and years and years. And as I mentioned, this is the standard for how most things connect to other things in the world of the internet. So curl is installed by default on your Macintosh operating system. We've seen that in the custom function series that we're taking a look at. We'll look at some command line use of curl. But most importantly, we'll look at how we can see the curl documentation. I'm going to give you a really nice trick or tip that you can use not just for the command line documentation for curl, but for pretty much any command line tool on the Macintosh. Now, the way that we're going to use curl within FileMaker, and I should also mention the reason that you want to know how to use curl is it's pretty much the only way that you can interact with web services. Web services being REST and uh, SOAP, pretty much anything that you're going to communicate with another remote site, get some type of response back, and then do something with that data within FileMaker. And FileMaker, being a citizen of the software development world, very much needs to be able to communicate to external services. For example, I've worked with Authorize.net, Vimeo, Twilio for the purpose of sending SMS messages and multimedia messages, um, weather services, postal services, address services, you name it, there's a service out there that you can connect to, but in order to connect, you need to be able to send the data in the right format that the service expects, and then once you get a response, be able to process that response and do something with it. So really the only ways that we can do that right now in FileMaker are using plugins. Now there are two plugins that I use in particular, but there are other plugins that are available. The one plugin that is freely available is the Base Elements plugin, and it is the one that I pretty much have installed on pretty much FileMaker all the time. You can access that at the URL goya.com.au slash base elements slash plugin. Now the reason that this plugin is so nice is not just because it's free, but because it provides a list of other functions that really make it useful, not just for curl, but for doing other things, file operations, you name it. But be warned, any plugin that you install on a FileMaker host, unless you've locked things down and done some type of security audit or review, the plugins that I'm suggesting give you full access to the operating system. So you have to know what you're doing when you install these plugins, at least from the standpoint of server. So here you're going to see that you can install the Mac, Windows, or Windows 64 version. You get the version that makes sense to your platform. And once it's installed, you're going to see when you go into the preferences, which I've done now under plugins, you're going to see the base element plugins. And when I select it here, we can see that I'm using version 3.3.1. Now, another plugin that I like to use is a paid plugin, and that is the MBS plugin. In fact, most of my commercial developments will use the MBS plugin because it has more functions that you could ever think of. And those uh, functions that you need that complement curl are typically those dealing with JSON, being able to parse JSON. 
So we'll take a look at just the base elements plugin because it's free and available to everyone. If you really want to use uh, curl, then I would suggest, and you want you need access to other functions, I would suggest the monkey bread plugin. And that's right here, which we're going to, I'll go ahead and throw up that URL. It's at mbsplugins.eu is where you can download a copy of the MBS plugin. And as you can see here on the website for curl, there is a ton of different options. In fact, all of these function calls all deal with curl. Now, if you are just brand new into FileMaker, I highly suggest that you not be overwhelmed by all of this information because you may be having enough of a time learning just FileMaker's functions, but go ahead and watch the video, finish it out, because understanding how curl works is going to be critical in terms of communicating or having your FileMaker database communicate with these external services. So, what we need to take a look at is how we use the base elements plugin. Now, a plugin will implement the way that you use a certain piece of software or technology in different ways. In other words, the way that base elements does it versus the way that the MBS implements the use of curl, and they both use curl because curl is an open library. And as I stated, FileMaker actually uses curl, although it doesn't expose it. Down behind the scenes, when you do an HTTPS post, using an insert from URL, it is using curl. And in this video, we're going to do a quick little example so we can see just one of the uh, many, many options that curl offers in terms of controlling how you communicate with these web services. So here on the base elements support site, which is at base element, base elements plugin.com. This is a very useful URL to know about base elements plugin.zendesk.com is where you're going to find the documentation for the base elements plugin. Very critical to know. But here you can see, most importantly, that we have a number of different methods. Now by itself, curl does not necessarily provide these methods as things that you would call, but what base elements has done is they have wrapped around curl and made it easier for you by actually designating each of the different types of calls that you can make to web services. These web services are such as they basically all of these functions in the base elements plugins directly represent the types of calls that you make to web services. For example, get and post are two most common. Then we have patch, which is sort of like an update. We also have delete, which allows you to get rid of something. Then they also provide a put data and a put file. Now, all of these functions within the base elements plugin are basically convenience wrappers around what you can already do with curl natively, or within the case of MBS plugins, they simply just implement in a little bit of a different way. The biggest thing that you need to know about curl is that curl is basically a command line program. It's exposed within whatever software you're using, in this case the plugins, and you simply need to tell it amongst its plethora of options what and how you want it to behave. So in the rest of this video, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a look at how we can look at the curl documentation and then actually setting up and testing a way that we can work on our local machine and just see what's happening, see how we can control things with a very simple example. So just before we get to that, I'm going to switch over to this one. The only function that we're going to be working with in this video is the base elements HTTP get. Now get is just your standard simple request. Most all, all of the time, not all the time, but most of the time when you're surfing the web, you are making get requests. It's only when you actually decide to submit data or push something via a form or uploading a file or sending uh, XML in some cases that you're going to be using post. But I'd say probably 80% of what we're doing on the web or maybe even more is simple get requests. So we're gonna start with the simple and just do those. Now here on this tab, what we have, and I'll put that one on screen too for you, is all of the different curl options that are supported 
by the base elements plugin. Now it's critical to know that any provider that implements curl into their software, they get to choose what they want to support and what they don't want to support. They don't have to support all of the various options that curl has. So as we scroll through this list, this is the plethora of options that we're talking about. All of these curl opt underscore and then the actual value represents a unique and individual option that you can set as part of your communication or the transaction that you make with an external web service. service. So we've got things like user password, proxy user password, username, password, um, TLS, which is our basically our SSL or our secure method of connecting. All of these different options simply represent all of the different possibilities of what can be transferred back and forth. You're going to see things that you're familiar with, such as cook, uh, cookie, mail, from and auth, FTP, RTSP, SSL related things. And really what it boils down to is knowing what you need to send in order to get back what you expect. Now, in order to know what you need to send, you're often going to find that on the documentation of whatever you're trying to coordinate with in terms of a web service. Now, as I switch over here to this last tab that we're going to take a look at, we're looking at a list of all of the HTTP header fields. In fact, you're going to see right here in this area, as I zoom in, that HTTP has all of these different request methods. So it's important to recognize that when you're dealing with using curl, and within the context of these plugins, you're really not doing anything more than just making FileMaker act like a web browser in order to tell a web service, which is basically usually hosted on port 80 or 443, what you want it to do. Do I want to just get a simple return of a web page or a request from a JSON service? Do I want to get the head, which is basically just tell me the headers or what you would actually need in order to exchange. What do you expect versus what do I expect? What do I get back? Think about it in terms of somebody coming up to your door, knocking on your door, and once they knock on your door, you're then going to ask them for a piece of information. Who is it? Then they're going to respond, this is Bob. And then you're going to say, I don't know a Bob. And then Bob says, well, yes, you do. And then you say, no, I don't. And you basically don't respond to him. In essence, a response would be, in that situation, would be like a 404. You don't know or you don't return what the person is wanting. Post is when you're going to push things up. Put is when you're going to load files or things. Delete, pretty obvious. Uh, trace, not really something we need to worry about right now. Connect, patch is going to be an update. Options, those are things in terms of what are the different settings that you can get and expect from the actual interchange. So all of these different things deal with the request. The request itself must have certain settings depending on what you request. So as we scroll down here, you can see all of these different request fields. This is all of the hidden stuff that goes on behind the scenes whenever you put a URL into a URL bar or submit a URL to a service and request something. So all of these request fields basically outline what it is that you're requesting, what format do you want it in, what type of language do you expect to have it in, um, pretty much all the different things that you could set. Now the critical thing to recognize is that you don't have to use all of these. Some of them are very much optional, but there are a few of them, depending on the web service that you're working with, that must be submitted in order to get what you expect back. One of them in particular is this one right here, content type. In many situations, if you don't supply a content type to a web service, then the web service itself will have a default response. So for example, a web service like Vimeo, I don't know if this is the case or not, but you can, for example, say, as a request, I want to get back XML, but the default for the Vimeo service may be responding in JSON format or the JavaScript notation, notation format for um, structured data. 
So what you have to do is you have to supply, in many cases, a content type. What is it you're actually looking for? Now, in terms of a web form, you can see right here that this actual designation of application x ww form URL encoded, that's the basically the same thing when you submit to a web service as if you had been on a web page, typed in information within fields, and then submitted that using a post to a web form requesting whatever it is that you want and then getting something back. So that's only one of many different content types that you can actually submit. XML is one, JSON is another. There's a whole list of all of the, the different content types. And you, could, you can, of course, look those up using this MIME type right here in order to look at all of the different types. Long story short, you won't be using all of these, but you will be using a minimum of a number of them in order to tell the web service what you want. In particular, content type. Content type. Sometimes if you're providing a response, if you're actually on the receiving end of a request, which we're not going to talk about, but you can do with products such as RESTFM, also from Goya, you actually need to return things such as a content length. Let's say you're returning back an image and that whatever the requester made the request many times in order to facilitate a smoother transaction, it basically goes like this. Hey, I'm going to drop off some dirt on your front driveway. Oh, you are? How much dirt are you going to drop off on my driveway? Oh, I'm going to drop off about three yards worth. Okay. You both, between both parties in that scenario, have a sense of what's going to be exchanged. And the content length is just one of all of the different possible headers, both on the, receive, uh, the sending and the receiving end, that basically communicates what can be expected. So that's pretty much all that headers are about. They're just about communicating what do I expect and then what you get back. And that's what we deal with every day. You just don't see them if you haven't dealt with using curl. So let's get into curl now and find out how we can actually understand curl, all of its different options and read some, not read, but take a look at some documentation that you can read. All right, so moving along, the one most critical thing that you need to be aware of with regards to curl is looking at the documentation. Any developer worth their salt knows that basically developing is about reading documentation. That's if you can read documentation, you can be a good developer. Now there is a way to get the information about any command line tool. And here on the Macintosh, if I put in curl, I would be able to actually get something back by putting in for example, HTTP www.filemaker.com. And I will get a response of all of the HTML exactly as if a browser would. And then of course I could do whatever I want with all of this text. I could parse it, process it, you name it. We've taken a look at that in many other videos that I've actually shot. If I wanted to get just some information about what FileMaker would return, if I put in this dash I, I can get what FileMaker's web server would return if I was requesting this URL. So the dash I is basically saying, give me all of the headers that you return as a result of my request. So here are the headers that we're taking a look at. And some of these will match the request headers that we have up here on the Wikipedia page. But as we scroll down, we'll also get to, those are non-standard, these are all of your common or non-standard request fields, but as we scroll down on this page, we get to response fields. Now, as we go through these, you're going to see some of them that will match. For, for example, date. Well, let's look at what the FileMaker server sent when we requested HTTP FileMaker.com. It sent a date response header, and there's the date. A server. So as we scroll down, we can look at the other header that's over here. Um, we've got, where is, did I pass it? RS, there we go. Server, name for the server. Pretty straightforward. Set cookie. We can see that FileMaker is attempting to actually set a cookie on the machine. You can see when it expires and so forth. Accept ranges, connection, and here is our all important content type. FileMaker is telling us as a response, as a response of requesting, their web page that what they're returning to us is text slash HTML 
and the character set for that is UTF-8. So for example, if we were working with a web service, then what's important to us is when we make a request, we would specify a content type of whatever it is that we're looking for. Let's say for example, it would be text slash JSON and the character set is UTF-8. Our response that we would get back would hopefully be in JSON format, and then we would be able to parse that and do something with it. That is basically the core of how the whole of the internet is working. It's a bunch of requests and a bunch of responses, and knowing that these settings must be set when you make the request from FileMaker is what's so important. So how do we find out information about curl and documentation? Here is a very cool trick that I'm going to give you. I'm not going to tell you how to modify and edit your bash RC file or use the Z shell or do a bunch of different things, but I am going to type in a command for myself, which is a command that will not exist on your Macintosh machine, but you can, after I type this, use it on your machine. I've typed in which pman. So basically what we're saying is, I want you to tell me what pman is going to return. In my case, only on my machine, I have a function that I've defined in my bash RC file, or in this case, my um, ZSH file. pman is basically using a combination of commands that as you will see, will make it extremely valuable for being able to look up documentation about command line tools at least on a Macintosh. If you're on Windows, unfortunately, this probably is something that won't work because you won't have the preview application. So I, my apologies to those of you on Windows. So typically, when you're dealing with a command line application, the word man, or short for manual, is something that you can use in order to get information about any command line tool. So if I do a man curl, what I'm going to get is I'm going to get all of the documentation about my installation of curl. Now here's the key thing. When you go from one operating system to another, the version of curl that is implemented and the options that it provides can very much differ, just like they do in between Macintosh and Windows. Maybe Microsoft Word has different feature sets on all of the different platforms or operating systems. As I scroll down here, this documentation is nice but it's not nice to go through. One, you have to know that I'm using the J key in order to scroll through here. And if I use the space key, it goes a page at a time, but going back up, I have to use the K key in order to do that. So reading the documentation in this format, not so nice. So what we wanna do is we want to make it easier on ourselves in order to read documentation on the Macintosh for any command line tool. This is our tip right there. What you see on screen, that one command of man-t, whatever the input is, that's what the dollar sign one stands for, I want you to pass that, or using the pipe, pipe it over to the open command. Open command being only on the Macintosh, as far as I'm aware. And what I want you to do is I want you to use this dash f and pass it to an application of applications slash preview. And the dash F is actually taking and converting it, I believe, into um, PostScript. Either that or the man command right here is with the dash T. One of those is. But basically, this command of man dash T, take the input, pipe it to the applications preview app, makes it so infinitely easier to deal with documentation on command line tools. So rather than typing man curl, I'm going to type pman, which is my own defined function, and I'm going to type curl. So what's going to happen is it's going to take the man output, use the dash t flag, which I believe that's doing the, the conversion using graph to postscript or something like that, taking the input of whatever the command is, in this case curl, and it's pushing it over to the preview app. Now here comes the magic, there we go. What happened is on the fly, we made a PDF version of my curl documentation. Now what makes this so nice is it makes it so easy for me to be able to now search and highlight and copy within this documentation 
information that's useful to me. I can save it. I can put it on iBooks. I can take it with me on my mobile devices and look at this at any time that I want. So here you go. This is one of those valuable tips within my videos that can save you a lot of time because, of course, you can do this about anything. So if I want P-Man said, there we go. There's all my documentation dealing with the stream editor or the old standby for editing streams of text. So within this, what you're able to do is look at all of the possible options for curl. This is where you're going to get the definition of what actually is applied. So as we go over to our web browser and look at our curl options, these are what's provided within the file, the base elements FileMaker plugin. So if we don't necessarily understand what the user agent is, we can simply just go over here and look for the user agent. Now it happens to be that I have that highlighted right there. Dash A, double dash user agent, specify the user agent string to send to the HTTP server. And it gives me information about the user agent and how it works. Now here's one thing that I want you to distinguish between. Almost all of the options to a command line tool will have a double dash flag, such as dash dash user agent or dash dash any auth. But only some of the options, typically the most common options, have a shorthand version that uses one of the letters of the alphabet. So for example, a dash capital A is exactly the same thing as using a dash dash user agent. Now whenever you're specifying these on a command line within a shell script, it's usually best to use the longer format version because sometimes, given all of the letters that are possible, unless you really use them a lot, you can't expect people to know those off the bat. But in this case, we're not going to be necessarily specifying these command op or these flags because we're not using the binary version of curl. We're using a plugin that implements the, cur the command line version of curl, and that's the base elements plugin. So I wanted to provide you with this information so that you know how you can get the curl documentation so that you can basically go in and search for things such as user agent and use preview in order to highlight those and be able to get to the information really quickly. That's what makes it valuable for me. So what we're going to do now is we're going to actually implement and use the base elements plugin, making a call to a web server, but the web server is going to be running on my own machine. You can do the same and follow along as well. So let's take a look at that. All right, so now we're going to get into some nitty gritty details of working with the curl plugin and using that base elements get function and getting something from a web server. Now, the interesting thing about web servers is that you can't really see what's going on when you are not in control of the web server. All you know is that you make a request, you hope that you get the right thing back, and then something comes back. And many times when you're programming and coding, going through that process can be a little bit of a hassle. So it's always best to be able to set up a running web server on your own machine. Now, if you're on Windows again, I'm not, I don't use Windows a whole lot. I know that it's possible. You can install all kinds of different tools with uh, CYG Win. But on the Macintosh here, one of the things that we have installed by default is Python. And Python, along with Ruby and PHP and pretty much many other systems can actually be set up to be a local running web server. So in Python, there is such a simple command line that you can use. It's Python dash M simple HTTP server. And then you're able to actually specify a port. Now the default port happens to be 8,000, which is good for me because I actually am running FileMaker server on my machine here. It's using port 8080, and I have another service running PHP, which is actually running on port 80 for running PHP scripts. So as I run this, you can see what it says is it says serving HTTP on 000 port 8000. Now, if I go over to my web browser here and I actually put in localhost 8000 and simply hit the return key, what it's going to do is it's actually going to host my 
basically the directory in which I started that command. Now the difficulty is in this situation, we wanna see something that actually gets re returned. You can see right here, if I put this down at the bottom of the window and just scroll my web browser up so that we can see both, what you're going to see is that each time I make a request, watch down here in this bottom window where I request it and it says get 200. So basically the, this is a log item which is logging the fact that this web browser actually made a request using a get request and I'm returning a 200, which 200 stands for everything is okay. A-OK, -okay, we got a good response. So watch what happens when I go over here to FileMaker. Finally using FileMaker now. And let's take a look at my script, which is extremely simple here. Insert from URL, select with dialog off. So insert from URL requires that we have a field on the layout. And what is it that we want to request? We're going to request HTTP localhost port 8000. We're going to see what we get. So when I click run on this, what I get is the same thing that is shown within the web browser. And over here, I have another request. In fact, I can go over here and I can actually use FileMaker and run this multiple times. And you're going to see that request, uh, all of the requests fill up. Now, the one thing that we don't have control over currently, or the one thing that we can't see is what is the user agent? In other words, who's actually making the, this request or what would be sent to the web server. So in order to do that, I'm going to cancel this server that's serving right now. I'm going to uh, use control C. It's going to cancel out. And one of the tools that I like to use is a tool called Code Runner. Now Code Runner is basically just a simple Mac application that does the same thing as what I did here in my terminal. In the terminal, I can simply run any type of script, a Python script or what have you, but I like using Code Runner because it makes it a little bit easier to see what's going on and edit my code. So I'm not going to take a whole lot of time to explain this, but I'll zoom in here on screen so that you can see the actual script. This is just a standard Python script that's using the same thing that I just did on the command line. It's using the simple HTTP server. So I import that, I also import a socket server, and I'm also importing a library called logging. You can see that we're using the same standard port of 8000. I've created a little, uh, well I haven't created this, I copied this from the web. Have to be honest, it's so much easier to search for the web, just search for a simple HTTP server in Python, and you'll find a ton of stuff out on the web. But in this case, what we're doing is we're creating an override for the get handler, for the do get which is part of the simple HTTPS server in terms of handling a response. But in this case, what we're doing is we're actually returning the headers so that we can see a little bit more about what's going on when the request is actually made. So a handler is established, uh, a socket server is created right here. It uses the handler, which means it's now going to not use the default do get that's built into the HTTP server, it's going to use this version and it's going to actually implement this right here, the logging errors. That's the whole reason of bringing this library in. And finally, it's just going to serve forever, meaning sending in a constant loop waiting. So as I run this, what we're going to see is the exact same thing that we saw in the browser. If I click a refresh right here, what we're going to see is we get the exact same thing right here, but we get a little bit more information in addition. We get the accept encoding, one of the headers. We get the connection. We get a cache control as a response. We get a user agent. Actually, these are all of the request headers. Um, we're requesting that we accept text HTML, also application XHTML and application XML. We'll, in other words, as a request, we will take any one of these as a response. We also get this nice little user agent right here of Mozilla 5.0, Macintosh, everything that identifies the browser. So what we're going to do is we're going to play a little bit here, taking a look at this and see what we get back from FileMaker when we use the base elements plugin. So first off, let's run the exact same thing that we did with our script of the standard insert from URL. Let's see what happens 
with regards to what the web server sees when FileMaker actually runs an insert from URL. So we'll run that. And we can see over here, the only thing that FileMaker is actually passing to a web server, uh, web server when you use insert from URL is it's passing the user agent of FileMaker 15, something I cannot control in terms of a header, meaning every time that I use FileMaker, which in the series I've been shooting about custom functions, if you're using the insert from URL in order to go grab content from Brian Dunning's website, he will have a ton of user agents, FileMaker 15, and guess what? When you're in control of a server, you can actually filter and deny requests based on any one of the given headers. So for example, if I was running a web server and I saw somebody doing request after request after request, let's say 1800 different custom functions, if they were all coming from FileMaker 15, I could block those just because they were coming from FileMaker 15. So that's an important thing to know about web services because sometimes you need to fake or spoof who you are. And that's what we're going to do here, not for the purpose of teaching you how to be a black hat hacker, but for the purpose of knowing that it's important to know how everything works. So we're going to use the base elements plugin now. We're going to go into the defined scripts and I only have one other script. That's the reason that this file is probably not gonna be on the article is because it is so, so simple that it's incredible. So what we're going to do here, I'm going to take this one off really quickly. Actually, let's go ahead and copy that and we'll put it up at the top and we'll see what we're going to do as a result of just our initial request. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to actually run this just natively with the simple little FileMaker func or the uh, base elements function of BEHTTP get. So as I zoom in here, this is the most simple function call that you can make with the base elements plugin that will actually use curl to go to this website, request it and return whatever it returns by default. In this case, it's text slash HTML. So as we say, okay, the only difference between using FileMaker and using a plugin, or I should say there's a few differences. One, insert from URL requires that the field actually be on the layout. Boo, not good. Why should we have to do that when all we're doing is requesting from a service? Using a custom function or using a, I should say an external function from a plugin, one allows us to do this all within memory and especially within variables but also it allows us to put a very complex series of requests or all of the different settings into one super simple custom function. So if I'm working with a web service, my preferred method is to actually create custom functions that will actually use external base elements functions or MBS functions in order to go make requests to web services and then bring them back. Then I can do whatever I want in order to parse all of that information. So as we can see, we'll go over and show my data viewer. I'll bring that on screen. I already have all of the contents that were returned into the global variable. We'll clear that out so that we can see what's going on and we'll run the function. So here is our FileMaker script. We'll get this off screen so that we can see what's going to be returned by my server. I'm going to click the run button and we can see that my HTTP result got populated with the exact same content that insert from URL does. We can also see that when we take a look at the server itself, what we're getting is Matt's FileMaker database. That's because I had actually previously set the user agent in order to be whatever I want. So one thing I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to clear that out. That's actually a good mistake that happened there to me. Reason being, when we take a look at our script, when I was setting up to shoot for this video, as you've already seen, one of the things that I was doing is I was actually setting the user agent to be what I wanted it to be. The default, I believe, is actually, it says libcurl from base elements plugin or something to that effect. I think I'd have to uh, flush this by setting it the user agent to nothing, which we can go ahead and do right now. 
or I'd have to restart the plugin. But long story short, the way that you control all of the different settings that we've taken a look at. So when I was on that web page and we were looking at all of the different request headers and the response headers, we'll switch over quickly just in case you forgot. All of these different headers, transfer encoding, TSV, very warning. And again, most of these you do not need to know about or even remember. The ones that are most important are content type and sometimes content length. And if you're working with different languages, content language. Typically, content encoding, you're not dealing too much with gzipping content, which is basically when a web server responds, it can compress its content before it passes it back to you, because obviously sending something smaller takes less time and is quicker. Then when the receiving end actually sees that the content is gzip encoded, it can uncompress it and then actually display it within the browser. But for the most part, web services, your number one that you need to be concerned about is typically not content length, content type. So anything that you want to submit, that's going to need to be set as a curl option. So here in the base elements implementation, this is the way that I like to do it. I will use a let function and I will define all of my different options by actually pasting them right in here. And I will simply name the variable the exact same as the header or the field that I need to pass. So content type basically becomes the content type. Now here is where I would need to look this up in terms of what it actually expects in terms of how base elements has implemented this particular header. All that is is a quick trip over to the curl options and I can put in the word content and look for that. I can jump to it and content transfer, content length. It's in here. Sometimes it doesn't, it's a little bit difficult to find. TLS SSL type. You know what? I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but basically setting that content type is a setting that's in here. I will simply go find that and be back in probably zero seconds for you. All right, and there we go. There's the reason that I couldn't find it. I had to go look at some of my previous scripts and code. The reason is curl, in terms of its options, are different from basically header options. So header options, you need to use the custom or the function within the base elements plugin that is this one right here, the HTTP set custom header. And that's where you're going to set the header and then whatever value that you want. So you're typically going to have a mix depending on the web service that you're connecting to between the options that you need to set for curl, the actual application or the program that's doing the requesting and the returning, and the headers that you wanna set, which is what the website or the web service expects and versus what you get back. So switching back over to FileMaker, we can see what it actually looks like. Here in terms of our specification, this is what I'm going to leave you with and we'll run it one time on our web server that's actually running right here. What we have is we have a mix of different settings. We are going to be setting curl to have its certain options if we want to change them. For example, what is the, uh, who's requesting this from my web service? Well, in this case, I'm saying, I want to be recognized as my FileMaker DB, and I could have version 1.0 or what have you. Now, where this comes into play, if I had, for example, 1.0, this becomes really valuable to know, the fact that you can actually, within your FileMaker database, control and set your own user agent, because when you start to host your own web services, uh, using FileMaker's PHP or XML capability or what have you, if the version number varies, you can do different things in terms of what you respond back with. So if I'm creating some FileMaker software and I'm using the Base Elements plugin or the MBS, if I change the user agent, then my script that receives the request at the URL can actually determine if the user agent is a 1.0 user agent versus a 2.0 user agent, then I can handle diff I can pass different things back. 
There's just so many things that you can do by knowing that you can actually control these different settings in the interchange between the request and the response. Then we also have our custom headers. Now I'm going to let you know that there is a mix of different ways that I do this depending on the plugin. You can do all of these settings within one let function, but ultimately you end up with a lot of different similar settings. So another way that I will actually do this, and let's do it right here in the actual area, is I will do it such as this. I will put settings, and I will put settings equal to a list function, and that list function will simply have all of the different settings that I might have. This avoids me from having to set individual variables and writing whatever the content is, even though it's a very small call to a plugin, but I don't have to create individual let variables for these because I can basically have as many of these as I needed. Let's say, for example, I have all of my settings. And of course, you can actually call these header settings if you want. And I can do my header settings there, and I can just have another one right here. So let's get that one indented right there. So maybe I've got a content type of something, and my accept header is going to be um, what I'm actually going to accept back. I want to accept JSON back. So this wouldn't make sense, but it is something that you could do. You could say that the content type that I'm passing you as a request is text HTML. Well, actually, it does make sense. You can do this with some web services. The character set is UTF-8, and what I accept would like to accept back is a text JSON response. So I'm going to send you XML, but I want to get JSON back. And basically, you can set as many of these custom headers that you need in one list function within your let function, and then finally make your call down here at the bottom. The call itself, anything that has been set prior to making either a get, post, or what have you, all of these settings are what will apply when the call is actually made. So let's say okay to that. Let's see, a specified table cannot be found. We need to actually put a semicolon on that, and that should be good. We can actually run this after I save it and take a look at what we get over here as a result. So we'll run that. And there we go right there. We can see that the user agent that came in was my filemaker DB. And the accept is I want to accept text JSON back. And the content type that I've passed you is text HTML. So you can see all of the different headers that you pass. You can even, if you want to, let's do it just for fun. You can specify your own headers. In fact, when you look at the responses from a lot of different web servers, many times they may use a header, which is an X header. And an X header is an X header where you've got some type of custom setting. And this can be anything you want. And so as I save that, and we zoom out and I run this script, there is our custom header right there, X custom anything you want, and your responding web service can actually take that into account and do whatever you want. This is the way that you can program between FileMaker and your own custom web service, or you can take actions based on what responses return from the web services that you're working with. This, in essence, is what you need to know when it comes to curl controlling its own options, and also controlling your header and your response options, or you can't control response, but controlling your request options in terms of getting exactly what you want from web services. And there you go. That's going to be a wrap for this video about web services and curl in particular, and knowing how to look at those options and find out how you can set them within the context of the base elements or the MBS plugin. The one confusing thing that frustrates most developers is all of the different settings that have to be right in order to make things work as you expect. And one thing that I'll leave you with is the one of the most frustrating aspects in today's modern exchange between web services deals with SSL and making sure that you've got a secure connection between you and the endpoint that's receiving your request. There are things known as man-in-the-middle attacks, 
or DNS poisoning and all kinds of different things where basically if your FileMaker database was to make a request and let's say the DNS had been poisoned and the DNS was pointing to a different IP address than the one that you're expecting to go to, a whoever hijacked that DNS basically means that you go to the wrong machine and maybe they'll give you information back, but it may be the wrong information or information that uh, might somehow allow them to do something nefarious to your computer. But also you have things where you basically want to know that when you connect, that service is actually validated and exactly what you expect to be. And that typically happens with SSL. In that regard, the confusing part that deals with security is that SSL is not actually called SSL, it's called TLS or Transport Layer Security. So you have to know within all of the different options how to actually set up your TLS and set it up so that the certificates are validated. They need to be on both sides, or excuse me, on the client side. You have to have a list of trusted certificates that says, yes, the certificate that I've been handed back matches the certificate that I have in terms of the one that I expect. We now have a secure connection. We can now communicate and do the exchange. And that's the frustrating thing with web services. There are options within the plugins in order to ignore the SSL process. But if you want to have a functioning FileMaker solution that is taking security into account, then you have to actually go through the TLS setups with the TLS auth username and password, setting up the SSL certs and a root store of certificates and so forth. It's a little bit beyond this video, in fact, a lot beyond this video, but those are the hangups that developers typically come across when they're dealing with web services. It's basically all about having all the right pieces in the right place so that things work as smoothly as possible. And you just wait until something actually breaks, either a certificate expires or something goes wrong and all of a sudden you've got to figure out and troubleshoot what is happening. But ultimately, this is all the information that you need to know in order to interact with your web services. The rest of what you're going to need to know is basically how to locate, understand, and then implement the API of the web service that you're hitting. I've covered that in other videos on this website, and I can definitely do it more. Maybe I'll do a series about it. But for now, this is what we have with regards to curl and using it within a plugin. So as always, I'd like to wish you much luck with your own FileMaker development, and until next time, happy FileMaking. We hope you've enjoyed this video tutorial, and we'd like to say thank you for your subscription and your support. If you're not already a subscriber, head on over to www.filemakermagazine.com slash subscribe for more information about the benefits of joining.